All right, so we're continuing our sort of remote organic chemistry lecture method for now. Um, I'll have more to discuss soon about, uh, well, I'm going to set up Zoom as an office hour method, maybe this weekend. And also, uh, we'll probably have some kind of online homework here pretty soon, and I'm going I'm to set that up too. In the meanwhile, though, focus on my lectures, and like I said before, um, treat these like normal lectures. Pretend you're in class and you should take notes, learn the material, um, do the homework that I assigned as much as you can, and also um, you know, read along in the book if you can. You, it, you, know, you will be assessed on this and you need to learn the material. Uh, so any way you can do that is really going to help you. All right, so we finished chapter 17, now let's talk about chapter 18. What's chapter 18? So chapter 18 is about things called enols, enolates, and and the aldol reaction. Enols, enolates, and the aldol reaction. You already learned about enols a little bit when we talked about alkynes. So. Remember keto enol tautomerism. We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay. Okay, so let's get started. Um, first thing is kind of recall from from chapter seventeen. Recall from chapter seventeen that what's, what was the general theme of this last chapter? The, the general theme of chapter seventeen. Think about that. What what was everything kind of based on? And the general theme was that you'd have ketones and aldehydes, right? And you'd have nucleophiles. And the idea, the general theme of chapter 17 was that uh, nucleophiles would attack ketones and aldehydes and give you all sorts of things, right? What were the things that you could get? Well. You get something like that, right? You get protonated or whatever, like a Grignard. A Grignard kind of did that, right, as we learned. Well, we also have situations where th that was the outcome, right, like a double bond. And uh, what were the things that looked like that? Well, of course, imines. Remember imines and oxines and what other things? Um, you know, the, the hydrozones, all of those things. Um, looked like that. It was a C double bond to the nuke. What about this? What was well? What kind of things looked like that? Well, uh, so this was a, this is mostly imine derivatives, imines, oxines, etc. But there, there, we also had a, a situation where it was carbon single bound to the nuke, and then you had an alkene. Um, remember what that in a, uh, situation where we saw that uh, enamines. Remember enamines. So enamines were an example of that. Were there other things that you know nucleophiles added and got gave us other stuff? There were. Um, Of course, we did get this situation, but this is like after additional reaction. What, what reaction kind of wiped off the ketone? Wiped off the ketone it was the Wolf-Kishner. I'll, I'll abbreviate that W slash K. The Wolf-Kishner reaction would wipe off the, al uh, the ketone, essentially. You know, it went from a ketone to a hydrozone to the alkane. That was called the Wolf-Kishner reaction. We also saw situations where like a ketone would be converted to an alkene. What was that reaction? Ketone getting created, sorry, converted to an alkene. Well, that was called the Wittig reaction.
the Wittig reaction. Was that it? Were that all the situations we saw? We saw another one too. Uh, something like that. We saw with the uh, acetals, cyclic acetals. Acetals, what was the element? It was, was the nuke was uh, oxygen, right? And yeah, what was it? What was the name of that thing if it, if the nuke was sulfur? It wasn't acetal. It was something else. Acetal. It was thioacetal. So we had acetals and thioacetals. Acetals and thioacetals, which is the sulfur equivalent. So this is kind of like the key things from chapter 17. I'm not showing all the details, but that, like the, the main theme was nucleophiles attack ketones, right? All right, so what about chapter 18 now? Now, chapter 18 is going to be what? What's the difference between 17 and 18? So in 18, the theme is a little bit different. I shifted it over to the left a bit, OK? So in 18, it's kind of like we have ketones and aldehydes. And now it's kind of a little more, rather than, rather than nucleophilic attack to the ketone, it's more maybe a base takes off this proton, maybe a base takes off this proton. I'm going to draw it a little nicer for you. Let's draw it it's a little nicer for you. OK. So a major idea from chapter 18 is not necessarily a nucleophilic attack of the ketone, but base takes the proton. Kind of like this. And you now you have these kind of these kind of things, these kind of molecules. You know, and why uh, why would the base take that proton? It, it's, it must be maybe a little acidic. And and this turns out to be actually resonance stabilized. So there's there's resonance structure, right? So this is a resonance stabilized thing. It's not an RSCC. It's not a resonance stabilized carbon cation. But then the, the is right, it's not a carbocation. It's actually a carbanion, right? And what do you think what kind of reactions might happen if the carbon's negative and you have electrophiles, you can in the mixture, you can imagine that the carbon would attack the electrophile. And that's what happens. And so Kind of like, this is kind of the, the, the theme of chapter 18, you know, with a, a lot of variations of this, right? Chapter 17 was nucleophilic addition to ketones and aldehydes. Chapter 18 is going to be a little bit more of like reacting at the uh, next door position, all right? And making these kind of, these kind of things. I'm going to give this a name right now and call it enolate. Enolate. We'll use that name again in a bit. Enolate. Uh, real quickly though, what's you know what did we call this? Because we, we talked about this before also. What was this thing called? It was it's kind of like an alkene and an alcohol, right? So it, it it had a different name, not enolate. It was enol. So what's the difference between an enol and an enolate? What do you think? What's the difference between an enol and an enolate? It's the enolate is negatively charged. If the enolate is negatively charged, the enol is neutral. Okay? So like you could say the enol is like an enolate, but it's neutral. Or you could say the enolate, enolate is like an enol, but the enolate is negatively charged. So that's the that's the relationship between enol and enolate. Alright, so that's kind of an overview of what's going on in 18. And there's a lot of little twists we have to Navigate through. Okay, so here we go. Let's get into chapter 18 now.
Okay, so first thing about uh, ketones and aldehydes and kind of their acidity is, well, they are acidic. They are acidic. Acidity of aldehydes and ketones. The, the next door position um, is slightly acidic. And, and remember, what the things we're making are enolate, enolate anions. All right, so as an example, if I have a ketone and I look at the neighboring position, this also applies if I have an aldehyde. So there's a ketone, and I'm drawing the, the neighboring CH. Um, Remember, there's a, a method to um, quantify the acidity of neighboring CHs, right? And like I said up here, they are slightly acidic, and so relatively acidic, meaning the pKa is maybe a little bit lower than for an alkane. So the pKa is 16 to 21. Sixteen to twenty-one. So that's, you know, what's that relative to? And I, I could just say it's roughly twenty. Twenty is a pretty easy thing to remember. So ketones roughly twenty. What are some other pKa's? Uh, carboxylic acid, alcohol, alkyne, alkene. Okay, so you're not really expected to memorize pKa's, but it doesn't hurt <laughs> to know a couple of them. Like a ketone, you should maybe know is roughly around 20. Carboxylic acid, of course, um, carboxylic acid, of course, the name acid suggests maybe a little acidic, right? And that's around 4 to 5. So that is relatively acidic. It's much more acidic than this 20 uh, pKa proton. Alcohols are around 15 or so. Alcohols are around 15. We saw we saw alkynes, and you know what did we what do we remember about alkynes and acidity? Well, they were kind of acidic, and we, we could rip off that proton with a base, make it nucleophilic, and go attack stuff. That was a, that was a key point of the alkyne chapter, was that we could deprotonate an alkyne, right? What base? Butyllithium or something, right? So, right, we, we, we saw that I could take an alkyne, rip off the proton, and then attack electrophile, right? That was the whole point of the alkyne chapter, one of the whole points. Okay, so the pKa of an alkyne is also roughly 20. So roughly about the same as a, as a ketone, so it's slightly acidic. Alkenes are not very acidic. It's about 45. And if you just have an H on an alkane, it's like insanely non-acidic, and it's around 50 to 60. Yeah, so al alkanes, and that's why, that's why when you use butyl lithium as a base, it's like an insanely strong base, right? So like the base we might use for the, al for the alkyne reaction might be butyl lithium. And the reason that butyl lithium is such a strong base is because its conjugate acid, butane, has an insanely high pKa. That, that kind of is, that sort of explains why we use butyl lithium as a strong base. Okay, great. So that's, a, you know, that points out that ketones and aldehydes are roughly, you know, a, a, little, bit, a little bit acidic. So why are they acidic? Why are they acidic? So we say, therefore, quite acidic. Ketones and aldehydes are quite acidic, relatively speaking, compared to other alkanes. So why? 
why, there's a general answer for this question in organic chemistry. Whenever I say, whenever I say, oh, you know, uh, this is acidic or that's acidic, the, the general answer is always going to be resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Resonance So on, on homework or exam problems, that's always going to, not always, but most of the time is going to explain acidity. Alkynes did not have resonance. It was a different effect. But ketones and aldehydes, resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. So example, why, why is that? Why do we have resonance stabilization of the conjugate base? So, so the base takes the proton. Base takes the proton, right? And you get this resonance stabilized conjugate base. This is the conjugate base. Of course, this conjugate base is resonance stabilized. What effect does resonance stabilization give a molecule? Well, the effect is stability. So when things are have resonance, they're stabilized. So this conjugate base is stabilized. That's the conjugate acid of the, of the base. And so this equilibrium is if this is a sort of a stabilized product, is the equilibrium going to be favored on the left or favored on the right? It's going to be favored on the right. And that kind of explains the slight acidity of these guys. Okay, cool. So, and what do we call this thing? Not an enol, but an enolate. Enolate. All right. Okay, so let's show um, an example of this. Cyclohexanone has a pKa, this is actually around 25, a little more than 20, but you know, roughly we'll just say 20 is a good ballpark. And um, this is one of the standard bases we use in organic chemistry. It's called LDA. So if I say, what's a good strong base? Maybe a, a good strong base for ketones or aldehydes or esters or other things. Usually you would say LDA. And I'll say three letters, three letters, and you might say, oh, PCC. No, but PCC is an oxidizing agent. There's a, a couple three-letter things, and LDA is the three-letter base that we very often use over and over in organic chemistry. LDA, it's a strong base. Why is this strong base? Um, and um, this is the type of problem we would do in organic one when we're talking about basicity. So, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that, but the pen flew over my head. Okay, this is the kind of problem <laughs> that we uh, do in organic one, where we show the equilibrium of like an acid and a base to the conjugate base and the conjugate acid, right? Okay, so LDA, what's it, what's the, what does LDA stand for? It's lithium diisopropyl, because those are isopropyl groups, diisopropyl, amide, Where's the amide? Amide is a weird word here because it's, you know, it's not the kind of amide you're used to. The normal amide you're used to looks like this, right? That's an amide functional group. This is an amide. So is that an amide? Well, 
historically speaking, if you have a nitrogen with um, a, a negative charge, and it does have a negative charge. The lithium is positive, nitrogen is negative, right? We call it an amide. It's a historical thing. So another way to draw LDA is like this, negative, lithium plus. See it? So that's kind of a, another way we can draw that. That's LDA also. So this is a sort of an ionic representation. Ionic. This is a covalent representation. OK? So let's erase the ionic one. All right. So a question you might have is like, which way does this equilibrium go? You know, and um, to, in order to do this, you need the pKa of both acid, acids, and the initial acid, and then the conjugate acid of the base. So what is the amine pKa? Uh, some of you might know it. Um, you're not expected to know, remember pKa's, but this one, this one, I guess I, I know it because I studied organic chemistry a while, but it's 35. Okay. It's also in books. Roughly, amines of 35, okay? So 25, 35. And then the question is, which direction does this equilibrium go? Well, would you expect it to stay on the left or stay on the right? And if I said, oh, it's a good base, takes the proton, you would say, well, that would probably move it to the right. The way to do this is just point an arrow towards a larger pKa, right? So if it's going from 25 to 35, then the, the reaction's favored to the right. So you can figure out equilibria really easily this way. What's K? Um, so K would be the, uh, the K, the, the equilibrium constant, is K, K is 10 to the, kind of like the right side minus the left side. So 35 minus 25 is 10. 10 to the 10. That's, I'm not going to ask you to do that on an exam or whatever, but that's, that's how you calculate K, the equilibrium constant. So is that product favored or substrate favored? Well, it's very product favored. It's 1 followed by 10 zeros favored, right? So it's, it, this goes completely to the right because of that, okay? All right, so that's an example of an of a, uh, acid-base reaction, right? And then... Um, yeah. And is there anything I could do with this molecule? Is there anything I could do with that? Well, it's negatively charged, and it also has a resonance form with the carbon with a negative charge on it. A very common reaction that we'll, we'll see more in this, in this uh, chapter is that I can react with electrophiles. Or reactive electrophiles. So this enolate, enolates are nucleophilic. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, there's, there's maybe the naive answer and the correct answer. The naive answer might be like, well, oxygen, O negative, would attack the carbon and kick it off, right? Nucleophile electrophile. The, the thing is, the oxygen carbon bond is not that strong. So an alternative thing happens where the carbon attacks. A carbon-carbon bond is stronger than an oxygen-carbon bond. So we go to the other, you know, the, the enolate. The enolate swings down, kicks off, and now, now we're done. And that, that's actually a real, real reaction. So the ketone. The ketone swings down, and the carbon, the carbon, the, the next door position next to the oxygen, that is the nucleophilic carbon. This is the nucleophilic carbon, right? Nucleophilic carbon attacks this SN2 electrophile, and this is an SN2 reaction. SN2 reaction, and you form this product. Okay, all right. One more, a little bit of uh, nomenclature. We call the, the next door positions of a ketone, uh, like the alpha position, alpha. Alpha, so that's the alpha carbon. What's this H? It's also it's called alpha hydrogen. So we have alpha 
carbon, we have an alpha hydrogen. So we use that nomenclature all the time. Okay. Uh, what do you think this position is called? Maybe that's beta. Yeah, so this is the beta position. Maybe you want to say yeah, the hydrogen there, you might say the beta hydrogen. So you have alpha hydrogen, alpha carbon, beta hydrogen, beta carbon. All right? Cool. Uh, what else about this? You might say, you know, what kind of reaction is this? Well, we, we attached an alkyl group, an alkyl group, this is an alkyl group, at the what position? The alpha position. So you could, if you wanted a name for this, you could say it's alpha alkylation. Alpha alkylation. So that's an alpha alkylation reaction. Okay. All right. So we'll come back to this. Come back. We'll, we will come back. We will see later. But I wanted to introduce this as like, you know, why would you do this? Why would you take off the proton? Well, because now it activates this as a nucleophile. You can attack electrophiles and make products like this. That's pretty cool. Okay. All right. So, so we kind of introduced the acidity, and let's talk about something a little different. Keto enol. And we, we've, we've introduced this to you before, so let's um, let's um, talk about this a bit more now. So, in addition to making an enolate anion, that's what we just did, right? We, we ripped off the proton and um, made an enolate anion. In addition to that, ketones, aldehydes, equilibrate to the enol form. Okay, so we, and we, um, we already mentioned the difference between an enolate and an enol. Let's see that again. Um, a simple example is if I have acetone, uh, a three-membered, three-carbon ketone. Um, there's an equilibrium between these two forms. And remember, they have names. Oh yeah, there's also, this requires either acid or base. H plus or OH minus? H plus or OH minus, okay? All right, so, and it's catalysis, it's catalyzed, cat. Okay, so, um, so these things equilibrate rapidly. It's a very rapid equilibrium, and we gave them names too. These, when we talk about this for a functional group, they're, they're called tautomers. So this is called the keto, Tautomer, tautomer is T-A-U-T-O-M-E-R, T-A-U-T-O-M-E-R. This is called the enol tautomer. Enol tautomer, okay, so we have these uh, tautomeric forms, okay? All right, and it is catalyzed by acid or base, all right. Are these the same as resonance? Are they? I'll, I'm going to erase the top. Same as resonance? A little question mark up there. Is it the same as resonance? Or like, are these guys resonance structures? Yes or no? Um, they're not. They're not resonance. Why are they not resonance? Because remember with resonance, you're changing around the double bonds, but you're not changing around single bonds. And of course, we have three hydrogens here. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Here we have two hydrogens, right? And it's almost like the, the third hydrogen got wound up, wound up in the oxygen. So 
Here you have three on carbon and none on oxygen. Here you have two on carbon and one on oxygen. So that is, these are not resonance structures. It's a, they're equilibrium. And that's, there's a difference between equilibration, which is an equilibration reaction, versus resonance. Okay, so it's not resonance. So what, the next question is, what's the mechanism for the acid or base catalyzed tautomerism? Um, what's the mechanism of it? Well, it's very easy. <laughs> You know, you learned, you saw this. You saw this a bit when we did alkynes. I'll show the alkyne reaction in a second. Um, and I said, I said, oh, you'll learn the mechanism soon. Well, now you're going to learn the mechanism. This is one of the easiest mechanisms in the universe. So you should not be intimidated by this mechanism. We have two mechanisms. One that's the acid catalyzed, and one that's the base catalyzed. All right? Cool. So. Mechanism of the acid catalyzed reaction is we're assuming, you know, when you have acid, you often have water, not always, but another way to draw this is H3O plus. You'd say, we'll do that. We'll say H3O plus, all right. H3O plus. These are the two tautomers. What are the names of them? There's the keto and the enol. Okay. What if I have an aldehyde real quick? Uh, if I have an aldehyde, it does the same thing. I just want to mention that. Aldehydes do the same thing. It's an aldehyde functional group, right? This is a ketone functional group. A ketone functional group, keto tautomer. This is an aldehyde functional group. And what's the name of the tautomer? It's an aldehyde functional group. What's the name of the tautomer? The answer is it's, it's, it's also a keto. It's a keto tautomer. Keto tautomer. So even though it's an aldehyde functional group, we call it a keto tautomer. So when we say keto tautomer, Enol tautomer. Those apply to either ketones or aldehydes. All right, so we cool with that. Let's erase this stuff now. Aldehyde. Okay, so the question is, how do we do this mechanism? And this is a very easy mechanism. So for the acid catalyzed mechanism, take the oxygen of the ketone, grab the proton. What does that make? A protonated ketone. A protonated ketone. How do we finish this off? It's actually very easy. It's a single step to go to the enol tautomer. All we do is draw water and do what? It's going to be a, a, a mild base and take this proton off. That's the mechanism. That's, that's how you go from a keto to enol. It's very easy, right? Maybe the easiest mechanism you've seen in this class. All right. Cool. So that's how, it go, how these go back and forth, from the keto tautomer to the enol tautomer, is using, uh, well, this is the acid catalyzed mechanism. We also have the base catalyzed mechanism. Uh, all right. And what, real quickly, real quickly, just a quick, quick review from al the al alkyne chemistry. So if I had an alkyne, and we reacted it with HgSO4, HgSO4, an acid, H3O plus. If you learned this, this is the, one of the first chapters after NMR we did. It, it made, it converted this to something else. What, what did it convert it to? You should remember the functional group. It, was, it, was, it made a ketone. So the, this is, a, I, I call this OMDM. Oxymercuration, demercuration, and it made a, a ketone, right? How many, how many carbons in the ketone? One, two, three, four, five. Five carbons, right? And 
I'm not going to do the full mechanism of it, but the main point of the mechanism is that after a couple steps involving mercury, you eventually make this, the enol, right? You learned that. That's what we showed before. And then I was like, well, something happens, and then you get the final product. Well, now, now we know what happens. <laughs> The enol and the keto are, are in equilibrium, and usually the keto is favored. This is favored. Usually. And so usually, even though this goes, it's favored on the left. The keto form is favored. Every now and then the enol will be favored. But um, generally speaking, the keto is favored. I'll explain why in a second. All right? So this is from before oxymercuration, demercuration and how you kind of made, you worked your way over to the enol, and then there's the last little step that we were skipping. And now, now you, you kind of see what's going on, and how the enol, enol tautomer, converts to the keto tautomer. All right, so this is this favorite, this favorite tautomer. This favorite tautomer. Okay, cool. So. That was the acid catalyzed mechanism. Let's do the base catalyzed mechanism now. So let's show the, the base catalyzed mechanism now. This is the tautomerism that's base catalyzed. So, all right. So, how do we do it? And thinking about what a base does, maybe the base does what bases do. Grab a proton. So, is that the alpha proton or the beta proton? It's it's the alpha proton. Alpha. So the hydroxide, hydroxy, or hydroxide is just going to be a base and rip off that alpha CH. Rip off the alpha CH. Okay. And I just, I go all the way to the enolate. Go to the... Enolate. Yeah, draw the enolate. And how do you think we finish this mechanism off? Going from O, o minus to OH. Now we just grab a proton from water. So, like I said, these these uh, mechanisms are insanely easy. So that is what happens. Okay. All right. So, and we already kind of mentioned, you know, uh, which which tautomer is more favorable. It's usually it's going to be the keto, and I'll explain why now. So this is the favorable tautomer. Keto, and this is the disfavorable disfavorable tautomer. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's let's show the the actual population of the keto and the enol tautomers in a real uh, example. Okay. So that's the base catalyzed mechanism. It's pretty easy, huh? Population. Population. So if I have like cyclohexanone, cyclohexanone enol, so those are two tautomers. The equilibrium is far to the left, so it's 99.99. Okay. 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 So even though it can go back and forth, it's really favored on the left. Okay. Um, 
The funny thing, though, is that even though the enol, enol form is disfavored, even though it's disfavored, um, even though the enol form is disfavored, and this is kind of favored, well, this is a nucleophile, right? This is, this is a, I'm sorry, electrophile. Things attack it, chapter 17. Loves to be attacked, right? So this is often an electrophile, E plus. Electrophile, right? This thing, as we talked about, well, you know, enols in general, we kind of talked about this, they're nucleophilic. They are nuke, right? They can attack stuff. I'll show that in a second, how they are nucleophilic. They attack stuff. So this is electrophilic, likes to get attacked. This is nucleophilic. It does the attacking. So my point is that even though this is very disfavored, it's like 0.01% or less, my point is that that's still, sometimes that's enough to do, the, do a reaction. Can still be used. Can still be used as a nucleophile in some situations. And I'll show those in a second. Real examples where the, all you, you know, this tiny amount of the right side equilibrium is successfully used as a nucleophile. Okay? So, what about, okay, I'm going to erase the bottom part there. It can still be used as nucleophile. And I'm going to add one more example. This is acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde. What was the top molecule name called? It was, um, Cyclohexanone. Sorry, cyclohexanone. Cyclohexanone. Okay, acetaldehyde on the bottom. Well, what 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 is its distribution? Um, it's also favored far to the left. So. In this case, it's about 99 to 1. About 99 to 1. So, so left is 99, right is 1. OK. Um, OK. All right. Done with that. Um, so I just said that the enol form is not very favorite, not very dominant, right? The enol form is not very dominant, but but that it can still be used to do reactions. And let's let's talk about a deuteration reaction. So that means incorporating deuterium. What's deuterium? It's D. It's a heavy isotope of of uh, hydrogen. Heavy isotope of hydrogen. So this is actually a, a, a use of this. Like we can actually attach deuterium, and like if I have excess excess uh, D plus and D two O, so we have a lot of it around. Okay. Actually, let's draw this other way. I'm going to redraw this. Sorry. Um, okay, so D plus, D plus and top. D2O and D plus. So it's D2O we call heavy water because it's like water, H2O, with a heavy isotope. D plus is just the deuterium uh, acid, like, like H plus, but deuterium. And if I I can imagine that I can deuterate every one of those positions, the alpha positions of, of this molecule, and make H2O essentially. Um, so, and and I guess to go completely to the right, how would you do that? Like, if we want to extensively deuterate that molecule, we just use excess of this. 
you have to balance the equation. But my, my point is that uh, you, can, you can equilibrate the alpha positions from being all hydrogens to all deuteriums. And that's, that's due to this acid catalyzed enolization. Okay? Um, so by having excess D2O, excess D2O, each of the alpha positions will, will exchange to be deuterium. And, and, then, and then you'd form this as a, as a primary product. The book talks about this, this too. And so, so by having excess D2O, you could get this equilibrium go, to go from the left to the right. What if you had excess H, if you had this molecule, you had excess H2O, then it would go the other way, right? So that's just an exa one example, that, not the most exciting example. We'll, we'll have more exciting examples shortly. Okay. So we said that the keto tautomer was more stable. And the question might be why? Why is the keto form more stable? The book doesn't really discuss this. Generally speaking, the book's pretty good in explaining stuff. It does not explain this. So I, I'm going to give my, my explanation, my understanding. So if you have cyclohexanone with you know, keto, keto form, cyclohexanone, and we're showing the equilibration to the top, the enol form, keto form, keto enol. We have the keto form and the enol form. Um, we have the keto form and the enol form. And I, which one is the, the favorable one? We said the left is, right? The keto form is, uh, we will draw the equilibrium that way to show that the left is favored. And then the question is why? So one explanation I use to explain this is that, you know, how many CH bonds do we have on the right? How many CH bonds? We'll say we have two of them, right? Two CH bonds. You don't really know bond strengths, but you should <laughs> kind of say, you know, know that CHs are, are strong bonds. So uh, CHs are strong bonds. So strong, two strong bonds, two strong CH bonds. And, and then here you have kind of like a one, a one OH and a one CH. Okay. And Equi uh, uh, thermodynamically, the OH bond is, is less strong. And the CH is more strong. Okay? So you can kind of, you know, there's, there's additional calculations we could do. But I mostly just say, well, we got two really strong CH bonds, and here, you know, like we have a, an OH and a CH. The OH is not as strong, and you also have a CH. But if you can put this all together, which side's more favorable? Well, the, having two CHs is. There's also the effect of the C double bond O versus the C double bond C, but that's not as, not as important here. The big thing is the two CH bonds on the left versus only one CH and an OH on the right. And OH bonds are not, not strong. So there's some bond energy calculations you could do to explain that. All right? Net result, keto form more favorable than enol form. Okay? Are there cases where enol forms are actually more favorable? And the answer is yes. Here's a simple one. Whoops. So that's cyclohexane 1, 3, 5 trion. Cyclohexane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
This is cyclohexane 135-trione. Trione. Cyclohexane 135-trione. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 3, 5, trione. And what's its, like if it equilibrated, what would it look like? It could equilibrate to this. So that's like all of the ketos went to enols. And any guess which of these is more favored? Well, this is different than the other situation, and this is the favored side. Due to what? What what what's different about this one? Obviously you make a benzene ring as aromatic and stable. So aromatic stable. Very cool. Okay? So that's a case where enols are, are clearly favored. Okay. Okay, so that's keto enol tautomerism. Um, we're gonna tr we're gonna jump in and do a reaction now, uh, like using this as a synthetically useful reaction. Let's try this reaction out. Okay, so we're, we've kind of talked about enols and uh, keto forms and kind of the. Um, well, that the, the keto form is electrophilic, likes to be attacked. The enol form is nucleophilic, it likes to do attacking. So let's show an example of an enol form doing nucleophilic attack. Enol form being a nucleophile. All right. So this is a reaction. This is one of the reactions you learn in this chapter. Number three, we're calling it acid catalyzed. Acid catalyzed halogenation. of ketones and aldehydes. Acid catalyzed halogenation of ketones and aldehydes. What do we mean by that? Obviously something about halogens, so maybe we're adding a halogen. And and if you have a ketone and We're going to react with bromine and acetic acid, Br2 and acetic acid. And what this reaction does is it installs a single Br on the ketone. It installs a single Br on the ketone at which position? We'll say, well, there's two alpha positions. This is putting it on the right side, alpha position, um, not the left. It's only, it only, like, in, of course, left and right are the same here, so there's no, no difference. Anyway, um, and this is actually a pretty simple, simple reaction mechanism. How does this work? Well, what does the acid do to a keto form? It's a, this is acetic acid. It's just a, it's a, it's an acid catalysis. And so we're just going to uh, protonate the keto form. And now, what we're basically doing is the, the acid catalyzed enol um, mechanism. We did earlier, right? Protonate and then do what? That's the conjugate base of acetic acid, and it just takes the proton off. So all we did is make the enol. Uh, one more arrow, right? One more arrow to make the enol, okay? Cool. And what did we say about enols? Are they nucleophilic or electrophilic? They are nucleophilic. Enols are nuke. 
You should know VR2 is an electrophile. This is an electrophile. E plus, it likes to be attacked. Well, guess who's going to attack it? The enol, the nucleophilic enol. So all this does is swings down. So just like an enolate can attack things, we saw that. First thing we saw was an enolate attacking alkyl halide. Just like an enolate can attack an electrophile, so can an enol. So enols can attack. So that's the mechanism. Let's fix the first arrow a little bit. Okay, so yeah. And I'm missing one more arrow, right? Because it attacks the BR, and what happens to the other BR? It goes away. And what do we got? Now we have a protonated ketone with the BR in the right place. And what, what do you think happens? BR minus. Takes out the proton, and there you go. There you go. That's the mechanism. Okay. Cool. All right. So that is the basic idea of this. There's a tiny bit more to understand, but hopefully not that traumatic of a, a reaction. All right. Acid catalyzed halogenation of ketones and aldehydes. So let's keep going. Um, interestingly, this reaction stops with a single bromine. Stops at monobromo. Stops at monobromo. So there's no dibromo. Or tribromo or anything like that. We'll see why. It's an interesting story. It's an interesting story. Okay, and what's the interesting story? Well, why does it do that? Let's draw another example. Got a ketone. We have acetic acid and bromine. What's an abbreviation for acetic acid? Acetic acid, right? Um, Sometimes we abbreviate it HOAC, acetic acid, okay, uh, which is the same molecule. Okay, so what, what do we? What happens uh, after this reaction? What, what, what do we get? We we install a something somewhere, right? Bromine gets incorporated into the alpha position. All right, so then we get that, and then the question is, why doesn't it keep going? Why doesn't it just keep going? Why doesn't it do it twice? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> it doesn't happen. I already said that, right? It stops at monobromo. So why does it stop at monobromo? That's the question. And so let's just go to the next intermediate. And it, it, go, it can go down. I'm going to step ahead and say it, it, it's reversible and not favored. But what would be the next step? If, if it wanted to go more, if it wanted to keep going, if it wanted to keep going, how would it do that? Well, it would, it would protonate, right? Just like we did before. From acetic acid, protonate. We have a lot of acetic acid, so protonate. And It would protonate, right? And then, would, and then it would keep going, make the enol, take out the proton. I'm not going to show that, though. But let's just show the, um, the resonance form of this. This will explain why it doesn't keep going. So what's the resonance? You just push the electrons up uh, to the oxygen. And what does that, show, what does that give you?
you have an oxygen, electrons go up on oxygen, and you have a positive charge in carbon, right? See it? So we have this drawn nicely. Okay, so we have that's the resonance, right? That shows the resonance structures of this thing. Well, it turns out the bromine is delta minus, right? The bromine is delta minus. You have this positively charged thing in the distance, right? Let me see it. I'm going to move over a bit. Wait, yeah. Hopefully you can see that. It's in the book also. Uh, maybe I'll draw. I'll, I'll redraw the bottom thing a little nicer. Okay, just redraw the, that thing. Okay. Plus charge in carbon, right? This is delta minus. Okay. Because of the delta minus on VR in a, in a nearby positive charge, this is very disfavored. Okay. So it's in resonance with a disfavored thing. It's in resonance with a disfavored thing. And it doesn't want to do that. So What's the net result? Is it will it will go in equilibrium with this thing, which would be needed to keep going, but it's disfavored. So what's the net effect? It stops here. It can't really keep going because in order to keep going, it would have to proceed through a resonance disfavored, a disfavored intermediate, right? A, a, a disfavored intermediate. So that's what did I say here? stops out at monobromo, no dibromo. And what's the reason? Is because once you have one bromine, it, can't, it really can't keep going, okay? You can't go, go to the next, um, the next step, okay? So that's why we only get one bromine incorporated in this acid-catalyzed mechanism. So it's an acid-catalyzed bromination, all right? What we're, see, what we're gonna see is the base version is a little different. Okay, so. Was the reason it was high, it's a it's a it's a carbon a carbocation next to something that's delta negative. If the delta negative um, is pulling, is pulling on a carbon with nothing on it, and that's that's really uh, disfavored. Okay, all right. Okay. So what we just showed was, and we're kind of wrapping up now, I just want to show one last thing. What I showed was that if we did this acid catalyzed halogenation, alpha halogenation, that it stopped with a single halogen, right? That's what we showed. So what happens if you use a base to do the same exact thing? So however, so we're continuing the last reaction. However, base mediated halogenation is exhaustive. So this is going to be the different outcome. So let's let's show what I mean by this. We'll take cyclohexanone and we're going to do Cl2 and AOH. So base, and we're having Cl2. No big di difference between Cl2 and Br2. We're just picking Cl2 for fun. And we'll, we'll uh, step through this, but this will chlorinate once, and then it'll keep going. and give you the tetrachloro, the, the exhaustively chlorinated 
molecule. Okay? So it will keep going. So this is a final product. Okay. So then the question is going to be, why does it stop with acid at the one and keep going when you have base? Well, there's an easy answer for that. So what's our mechanism? I'm going to, I'm going to redraw my base as B dot dot up top. It's, it's OH minus, but let's just have the base take the proton. Enolate, make an enolate. enolate. You got your enolate. And this is actually very easy now. Enolate, we're, just gonna, we're going to just use the enolate rather than go to the enol. Because the enolate, you know, we can draw the mechanism with the enolate. Of course, it, it will probably go to the enol as well. But the mechanism works just as well with the enolate. So this is an enolate, not an enolate, right? Enolate. Base tick proton made an enolate. And how does this happen now? This just swings down to tax and you're done. That was easy, right? That's, that attached the first chlorine. Now we do it again. What's the base going to do? We're just going to grab that right side one. It also grabs the left side. but. This will illustrate the point. Here I'm going to actually, just for illustrating this, it helps if I just put, draw this, this resonance structure of the molecule. So I'm just going to push the CH onto the carbon. Of course, it is in resonance with the enolate. So what would that give you? That's the intermediate, right? It's with a dot dot negative on the carbon. Yeah. And. Now in this case, this is delta negative and it's pulling, it's pulling electrons towards the chlorine. It's pulling electrons onto the chlorine. So it's pulling stuff. And what are you giving it? You're giving electrons for it to take. So it wants electrons and you're giving it electrons. So it's the, what's the, uh, how do we summarize that? We're, we take the stabilized. This is a stabilized anion. What we just showed with the bromine thing, with the la last thing, was it was unstabilized and it wouldn't go. So in this case, it's stabilized such that the reaction keeps proceeding. And so now, that'll go to the dichloro. Then it just keeps going and going. So that's, that's our explanation for this, how, how we get exhaustive chlorination under base mediated or acid catalyzed? It's, it's the base, base mediated reaction. Okay. So with a base, base it goes exhaustive. Acid, it only installs one. So that's, that's the main takeaway from this halogenation thing. All right, very cool. We got through some cool stuff. We, we'll keep going next time. I'm still aiming to do two lectures a week. Uh, they're probably gonna be you know, ready for you on rather than Tuesday and Thursday, it's probably going to be ready on Wednesday and Friday. So you, you can watch these whenever you want. You do need to know this stuff. So again, I recommend uh, take notes. Make notes just like you always did. And, and uh, index cards, these mechanisms, because you will, be, you will be tested on this eventually. And we will, we're probably also going to have some kind of homework thing going on pretty soon. All right. So so yeah, for now, just consider this your normal lecture, okay? All right, great, well have a good weekend.